Uh, without further ado, I want to introduce Robin Silvestri, our executive director. Oh, thank you, Todd. I appreciate that. Um, hello, everybody, and welcome to the speaker series. Today, we're here on the topic of uh, the state of the Bay with Dr. Christopher Gobler from uh, Stony Brook University. We're really excited to finally get some uh, data and see the numbers and really get a clear picture of where the Bay is. Before we get started, I'd like to um, welcome some of our distinguished guests who are in the audience joining us today. Uh, Gordon Canary from Senator Boyle's office. Thank hello, welcome, Gordon. We have Bill Doyle from Senator Alexis Wake's office. Thanks for coming down, Bill. We have Rob Carlaco with us, who is the presiding officer in the legislature. Thank you, Rob, for joining us today. And we have several other legislators with us, including Steve Flatteran, Anthony Piccarillo, and Jason Richberg. So thanks, guys. Thank you, Jason. Appreciate that. Uh, representing the New York State Assembly, we have Mike Durso and Jarrett Condolfo. Thanks, guys. Thanks for joining us. It, you know, we work really closely together with all of our municipal partners and our local political leaders. So uh, your, your presence here today is greatly appreciated. Uh, representing the county of Suffolk, we have Dorian Dale, Director of Sustainability. Thank you, Dorian. And Peter Scully, who we lovingly refer to as our sewer czar. Thanks, Peter. <laughs> I also want to give a shout out to some other members of the audience who are with us today who support our programs um, in depth, uh, including the Great South Bay Oyster Project partners. Uh, Maureen Dunn, who's here for representing SeaTuck Environmental. Hi, Maureen. Uh, Chuck, West Chuck Westfall from Lyoga, representing our oyster growers. Carolyn Sukowski, representing Cornell Cooperative, a, a great marine biology partner for us on the Oyster Project. Uh, Chris Clapp from the Nature Conservancy. Thank you for joining us, Chris. And Carly Schacht and the team from the Islip Hatchery. They've been a big support in us getting this project off the ground. Thank you, guys. So I'm the executive director of the organization, but I'm surrounded by a board of uh, dedicated volunteers who actually inspired me to join the organization in 2017 as a volunteer. So I'd like to just give a shout out to uh, Karen Marvin, uh, Rihanna Quinrati, Wayne Horsley, John Hall, and of course our president, uh, Todd Shaw. So thank you, let's welcome them. And finally, uh, I'd like to thank our Creek Defenders for being here. Andy Michelle, who represents West Islip. Janet Soley, who represents the Connectquat River. Ed Reagan, who provides support in the West Islip. And Todd, who represents the Babylon Creek Defender. Thank you. And of course, none of these programs happen without the support of our volunteers. So a big shout out to Kim Turret. Janet and Lauren Norander for coming down today, as well as Peter Judge, who is our independent filmmaker and will be creating, uh, will be capturing this entire presentation for us to share across our social media. Our social media has over 17,500 followers across Suffolk County and, uh, and is a big source of discussion on all topics related to the Great South Bay. So we're very happy to be able to spearhead that, uh, that effort. And so without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Gobler, and I'd like to read his very impressive bio for you. So Dr. Gobler is a professor within the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences over at Stony Brook University. He received his MS and PhD from Stony Brook in the 90s and began his academic career at Long Island University in 1999. In 2005, he joined Stony Brook University as the Director of Academic Programs for SOMAS uh, on the Southampton campus. In 2014, he was appointed as the Associate Dean of Research at SOMAS, and in 2015, he was named Co-Director for the Center for Clean Water Technology. The major research focus within his group is investigating how anthropogenic activities such as climate change, and here are some, some big words. We're going to be doing word of the day on our social media. Uh, eutrophication and the overharvesting of fisheries alters the natural, biogeochemical, and other ecological functioning of our coastal ecosystems. Within this realm, the major research efforts include the study of harmful algal blooms, which we see here as brown tides, mahogany tides, and blue-green algae, 
caused by multiple classes of phytoplankton in diverse ecosystems, as well as the effects of coastal ocean acidification on marine life. Dr. Gobler was born on and has spent his entire life on Long Island. He grew up enjoying swimming on Long Island's ocean beaches, fishing on the East End, and sailing on the Long Island Sound. His pursuit of his graduate studies in marine science was motivated by the progressive declines in Long Island shell fisheries during the 1980s. Although I could hardly believe he was old enough at that time. <laughs> During the past 20 years, his research, research has identified the key role excessive nitrogen loading has played in the degradation of Long Island's fisheries and water quality. With the establishment of the Center for Clean Water Technology, Dr. Gobler sees the promise of discovering the solutions to Long Island's nitrogen problems, as well as the creation of an industry that can create jobs for Long Islanders. So please welcome Dr. Gobler for his presentation on the state of the bay. Good morning, everyone. Good to see everybody. And uh, Robin, thank you for that introduction. It was a little embarrassing, maybe a little too long. But um, anyway, it's really great to be here. Uh, I've always had great respect for Save the Great South Bay. You know, there's a lot of organizations out there, but uh, you know, I think Robin's point to 17,000 people on social media speaks volumes. I, you know, that's a big number, and uh, it's been a great group. So it's a real honor to be here talking to you all. And uh, wow, what a day! Right. This is the kind of let's 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 get through this. We can go back outside. huh? Uh, but yeah, what a gr great location. Thank you to the owner who I met uh, earlier, Richard. Um, thank you. Wonderful, wonderful spot here. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Long Island in general, uh, Suffolk County in general, talking, of course, about Great South Bay uh, and then also talking about sort of a path forward. The first half of my presentation is going to focus on what some of our problems are. So uh, we'll have a little light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I'll start by thanking all the people in my lab. I've got a couple of dozen young people, uh, very fine young men and women who are the boots on the ground and the fins in the water. Uh, in fact, I would, I, I, there's probably people in the water right now from my lab, right now in Great South Bay. We're doing some monitoring at Bellport Bay and uh, they're out on the water literally year round. Now that we've started growing kelp through the winter, uh, almost every single day. And so uh, I wouldn't be here without their hard work. Um, and uh, on the social media front, if you're interested, you can follow what we're up to as well. Although we're not nearly as organized as Save the Great South Bay on that front, I would say. <laughs> so I'm going to start with the idea of the watershed, uh, which I think is so critically important and doesn't apply anywhere more. Uh, I, Long Island is sort of the, the pinnacle of being on a watershed in that any drop of water that falls anywhere on Long Island eventually is going to be, have two critically important fates for all of us. It's either going to be the water we're drinking or it's going to end up in one of our bays, harbors, and estuaries. Uh, and so right there, that's really at the essence of living on Long Island. It's the water we drink and it's affecting every single surface water body. Um, and therefore, everything we're doing on land is going to alter in one way or the other, for good or bad, the quality of our drinking water and the quality of our surface water. So now I could walk away now because that's really what it's all about. Uh, but it's so important to keep in mind uh, as we move forward. And it's also, in my mind, very much can be a unifying concept for people because it's really not, it's, it, of course, it's about what you do individually, but we're all having an effect on everyone else. Um, and I, I won't belabor this too long, but even on the drinking water front, you know, it's easy to think, oh, I have county water and therefore I'm fine. Well, turns out your water, if you're getting stuff with county water, probably comes from a mile or two away at most. And so all the activities of yourself and your neighbors are affecting your drinking water and, again, the surface waters. Um, and I won't belabor all these points too much because I sort of already waxed um, uh, too long on these. But I, the, on the second, so, you know, the, the, this is what I was sort of talking about. I won't go through the quote by Martin Luther King, but he talked about this idea of the garment of destiny. It's really the concept. We're all in this together. And uh, we've got we've to work together towards change. And a uh, quote by Wendell Berry there I think is also a good one. Do unto those downstream as you would have done uh, to, uh, yeah. Do unto those up downstream as you would have those upstream do unto you. Uh, and, uh, and it's really true. And it's actually, there's actually a little bit of, uh, uh, there's a bigger societal, bigger societal message in there also because what that kind of means is that the people who live on the water are being really affected by the activities of people who live 
very far away from the water. And if you think about that, that has some important implications. It sort of flips the power, if you will. Uh, but anyway, we know where we are and how things have been changing, right? Long Island used to be a rural, uh, Suffolk County, particularly a rural community. In the beginning of the 20th century, there's now more people in Suffolk County than almost any other county in New York State, say for Brooklyn and Queens. Uh, and that's a true fact, more than Nassau, more than Manhattan, more than Staten Island. Uh, and with that, the nitrogen in our groundwater keeps rising. Uh, and that was a mystery as to why that was happening uh, not too long ago, frankly, a decade or so ago. Uh, it was a little bit of a head scratcher. Oh, but I, the other thing I'll point out, beyond the water, the groundwater levels rising, the ground, water, nitrogen levels rising, the groundwater, they're also rising in our surface waters. This is from Suffolk County's uh, wastewater subwatershed plan showing a 60% increase in the total amount of nitrogen in our surface waters uh, in just a decade from two, uh, 2006 to 2017. That's a big change. Um, but getting back to where the nitrogen is coming from, again, if this was a decade ago, we'd be scratching our heads and most people, if I asked the question, would say, oh, it must be the runoff, right? And so now we've done the math. It's been done over and over and over again. The biggest source of nitrogen from land to sea in Suffolk County and on Long Island is wastewater, right? And, uh, and the fact of the matter here is in Suffolk County, 70% of homes are not on a sewage treatment plant and therefore people have what are known as on-site systems that are draining right into our groundwater that is our drinking water and is therefore thereafter discharging into surface waters um and so that's been the great reckoning of the past decade that realization that wow you know we've built out this county in a way that the water is getting very polluted and it has consequences um and this is a map that I made last year. Maybe I'll flash the one for this year. Just put this map out last week. So this is new news. I actually had a press conference with uh, Peter Scully was there uh, a week ago. Uh, and this, this map shows all of the water quality impairments across Long Island in just a four month period. So this work that my laboratory began in June, we finished in September. Uh, and so what you can see is that there is not a coastline across Long Island from the east end to the South Shore, to the North Shore, Nassau County, Suffolk County, that's not experiencing some kind of water quality impairment. And in this case, I'm, I'm not using a uh, my judgment, I'm using standards. So the DEC has a standard for oxygen. So the dark blue zones are what we could, you know, unfortunately we would call, scientists call those dead zones, not enough oxygen. And then all the other co colors are, for the most part, harmful algal blooms um, uh, that can be either have a negative impact on human health or on the environment. So on that front, I'm showing here three different types of harmful algal blooms that make biotoxins. So these are serious issues. These are toxins that get into shellfish. If you consume those shellfish, you can become very, very sick. Uh, last summer, a man died in Alaska consuming shellfish contaminated with paralytic shellfish uh, poisoning toxins. Um, but you know, unfortunately, that's not the end of it. There's a whole second class of harmful algal blooms that thankfully will not kill us uh, and will not kill our pets, but can wreak havoc on marine environments, can cause fish kills, can cause the die off of shellfish, um, and have and historically had been very, have had a negative impact on some of our most important fisheries here on Long Island. And just for point of reference, uh, harmful algal blooms are not new to Long Island. There was one documented uh, that was occurring way back in the 50s. You may, you probably know if you know your history of Long Island, duck farms were quite uh, prolific across Long Island, uh, on the South Shore in particular in the 50s. Mariches Bay, when, before these things happened, had no inlet. So it was just an enclosed bay with no inlet. All these duck farms to the north, so they were experiencing these things called green tides. Uh, in 1954, the uh, Ash Wednesday storm blew open the Mariches Inlet, and that ended these blooms. Uh, and then we sort of had this period, well, before I go to that, I'll, I'll just point between 60 and se uh, 1960 and 1985, where well, were there no harmful algal blooms? And I'm probably going to talk about it, but that was a very important period for robust fisheries on Long Island. Um, but since from 1985 onward, we saw just the onslaught of continually new types of harmful algal blooms. Uh, and so... I'll just, before I move on to the next slide, just point, if you look at this timetable, look at the period between 1960 and 1985. I will have you note that during that time, Long Island had the largest hard clam fishery in the United States. 
More hard clams were harvested here than any other place. More hard clams were harvested in Great South Bay than any other estuary on in the world uh, for hard clams, because it's a species you find from Canada down to Florida. At the same time, the East End had the largest bay scallop fishery uh, on the East Coast. Uh, and you could probably say in the world, because again, it's just sort of indigenous to that part. But with the occurrence of these harmful algal blooms, we've had a 99% decline in both of those fisheries. Uh, and you can draw a direct line to the nitrogen and these harmful algal blooms. Because we know that more nitrogen makes these blooms either more intense, or in some cases actually can make them more toxic. The toxins they make in some cases are nitrogen rich compounds. So if you feed them more nitrogen, they can actually make more toxins. Okay, so getting into some of the harmful algal blooms in particular. So you can see this image Hopefully, I, actually, I can imagine with the, <laughs> the glare, it's not perfect. But anyway, if you can see this image and you can look at that water, that's red water and something you would not want to be bathing in, probably. Uh, so you know something is amiss there. And something is amiss here, but on so many different levels. Uh, the water doesn't look right. But actually, as it turns out, this is an invasive species. Um, this is an invasive species known as, oh, and also, I got this picture from Robin the other day. Uh, that's actually wrecking havoc off of the coast of uh, Hexter Park right now. This same red water, uh, this was from, I think, 2019, closer to Bayshore. Um, and this is what's going on in Hexter Park. You sort of can see the red water there, but it's, you know, if you look, uh, look at it very carefully, it's very, very obvious. And so what this is, is an invasive seaweed called Daisy Siphona japonica. And from that, the species name japonica, that for Japan. This thing does not belong here. It doesn't belong anywhere in the Atlantic Ocean whatsoever. It's invasive. And so what I'm showing in this map here is that through the 80s and 90s, it spread through Europe. And the beginning of this century, it showed up for the first time further north of here. Uh, I think in Rhode Island and up, up close Maine. Um, but in the last several years, we've been able to document the fact that this thing is widespread across the south shore of Long Island. And you see in this map, a, re a red dot is a positive. And you can see for Great South Bay, this thing is everywhere. Uh, and again, it's invasive. It wasn't here. We don't know exactly when it showed up, but we do know now it's ever present across uh, the entire North Shore uh, and around the inlets uh, going into Narrow Bay as well. And in fact, I have a student. He might, even, again, he might be out right now, but Craig Young is uh, surveying Great South Bay again for this and other seaweeds. So, uh, in fact, let's take that back. He's definitely going out because I sent him that picture from Robin, uh, and he told me last night I'm going to go out and check it out. So, um, so, and you know what happens is it grows in the bay, okay, and, and you don't necessarily necessarily see it growing in the bay. The tricky thing about this, it grows year round, has an incredible temperature tolerance. So, the, one of the first times we ever saw it was, I believe, in this winter of I'm going to get it wrong, 17 and 18. The bay froze over. When the ice calved up, it looks like there was, looked like there was blood in the ice because this seaweed can grow year round. It has an incredible temperature tolerance. Uh, and in fact, the fact that you see the red water now might be because it's experienced warm water for too long. So it doesn't like it too warm. Uh, but when it washes up on the shoreline, it can look like this. I believe this is the summer of 2019. So you get a storm event, it sort of washes it up. And then, you know, the next thing that happens is it begins to decay. And believe it or not, that becomes a human health issue. This is a paper in The Lancet, which is the second most impactful medical journal on the planet. Uh, and essentially what, it, what this paper did, if you look at the shoreline there, this is actually from the Caribbean, but the idea of decaying seaweeds becomes an issue because when they decay, and if they're very, very dense, they can release hydrogen sulfide gas. And that can lead to all sorts of medical problems. In this particular case, they had 10,000 emergency room visits from people exposed to hydrogen sulfide gas from seaweeds washing up on the shoreline. Uh, and it's not just an effect on humans. So on the one hand, if it was just red water, maybe we'd say, oh, okay, well that's, you know, it doesn't look nice, but you know, the, th thankfully it's just red water. Uh, but we've done experiments with the water and what it, it turns out is when the seaweed's growing and it's happy uh, and, and everything's going well, it has no effect on marine life is what we found. But when you see that red water, that means the seaweed is decaying. And what we've learned is that when it's decaying, it's releasing compounds that are a whole suite of compounds, not the hydrogen sulfide, but other natural products that are harmful to marine life. And so in this experiment, you can see on the 
Uh, on the left is the survival of larval fish exposed to the living seaweed. They do fine. Uh, but in the face of the decayed seaweed, they don't even live a week. Uh, and that's in the presence of vigorous bubbling of the water. So you're getting plenty of oxygen. Uh, and we measured the ammonium. It's not ammonium toxicity either. And so we've worked, we've made measurements uh, using liquid chromatograph mass spectrometry at the university. They're definitely making natural products that are harmful to these fish. Uh, and the same thing occurs for hard clam larvae. So this is the larval stages of hard clams. I'm showing you their survival. Uh, and they're being exposed to, I see that uh, one and two are knocked out. So one and two are a control. Two, one is the control. Two is the live seaweed. Three is the decayed seaweed. And you can see they're not surviving. They're, the survival rate's only about 25% compared to around 80% when they're exposed to perfect conditions or even the living seaweed. So lethal to both fish and larval um, uh, bivalves. So the question is, why is it here? It's an invasive seaweed. Did it just show up? Or is there something about the environment? There's, a, there's an axiom in science called everything is everywhere and the environment selects, right? And so that means that the, you know, maybe the seaweed, at least some small propules of it, are washing around our waters anyway. And it really only takes off once the environmental conditions are ripe for it. So here's some results from an experiment uh, in a uh, journal article that's publicly available. We just published in the last year. Uh, and essentially showing the growth of the seaweed in, in order, if we do nothing to the seaweed, if we add nitrogen to the seaweed, if we add carbon dioxide to the seaweed, and then if we add the nitrogen with the carbon dioxide. And so what you can see is a stepwise function. And you can see that the growth rates more than double if you expose them to high nitrogen and high levels of carbon dioxide. I've already talked about the nitrogen, uh, and I'm not gonna, I don't have time. Actually, I will talk a little bit later about uh, carbon dioxide, but you know, the levels of carbon dioxide have risen by 40% in the last several decades, uh, both in our atmospheres and in our waters. Uh, and so we think that could, combination could be driving uh, the invasion of the seaweed. The last thing to figure out where's the nitrogen coming from, this is a little complex, but we use something called uh, nitrogen isotope fingerprinting of the seaweeds to figure out where is the nitrogen they're using coming from. And it really only gives you a, a two-fold answer. It tells you, is the nitrogen coming from fertilizer or is it coming from wastewater? If it's coming from fertilizer, the value that you would get in this nitrogen isotope would be minus three. If it's coming from wastewater, it would be around 10. And so what you can see is firstly, on average, the number is about nine. Uh, and oh, most of them are dead on for just wastewater. So essentially what this means is that it's, it grows more when you give it more nitrogen, and it's using wastewater-derived nitrogen to grow and proliferate in Great South Bay. Um, so really, this, this is, typifies this whole wastewater uh, issue. Okay, moving on to another water quality parameter I'll just quickly mention. Um, for the past seven, eight years, we've been working with News 12 and Newsday and reporting water quality out to Long Island once a week every summer. Uh, this information is relayed on the... Uh, weather reports on Thursday nights uh, at 5.30. Uh, used to be Bill Corbell. Now it's uh, Samantha Augury, I think, is the, uh, is, is the reporter now. And uh, they've both been very supportive of this program. But the most valuable data we've got out of this program is looking at oxygen levels. Um, and so, as, as I've already referenced with regards to the dead zones, high nitrogen can become an oxygen issue because you get an algal bloom, that algal bloom dies off and decays. When it decays, the process of bacterial respiration sucks the oxygen out of the water. And so, and that's why the DEC has very strict standards for oxygen. In fact, <laughs> oxygen is probably the only water quality parameter that for which there are strict guidelines at the federal and state level. And so in New York State, the oxygen level should never get below three. And ideally, the DEC would like to see them above 4.8. But when we look at the data we've collected from all that monitoring we've done, what we see is that most water bodies are violating the standard. Um, and so what you see here are 30 sites uh, all across Long Island from East Hampton all the way out to the, almost the Queens border. Uh, and you can see we had 17 sites that are below that three standard. We had six sites that are below the 4.8 standard and only a handful that are always hitting the mark. Um, and you can see there's many sites. I think all the Great South Bay sites in here um, 
say for the Bayshore Cove site, uh, are not meeting the standard. And this has consequences. I won't go into great detail, but you know, low oxygen leads to fish kills. And if you, I didn't point it out, but on the map that I had of water quality impairments during the last summer, we had fish kills in um, I think a half a dozen different water bodies across Long Island. Okay, so just to sort of get to the end, at least of the water quality part of the talk, um, you know, what is the state of Great South Bay? Well, this is a focus in on water quality impairment in Great South Bay during the last two summers. The top one is 2020, the bottom one is 2021. Um, and, you know, there's some differences between the years, but also some similarities. Uh, you know, in general, the water closer to the Fire Island Inlet is in pretty good shape. The water west of the Fire Island Inlet is in pretty good shape. Uh, and as it turns out, part of that is physics. There is great tidal flushing from the Jones Inlet to the Fire Island Inlet. They communicate very, very well. It's very interesting in that even if you go into Nassau County, the Jones Inlet, to the west of the Jones Inlet, in a place called uh, the western part of the bay or Hewlett Bay, the water quality is very, very poor. And there's been lots and lots of problems there. But when you move to the eastern part of the bay, and, and you, so we call it East Bay and Hempstead or South Oyster Bay and the western part of Great South Bay, things are pretty good. And that's because the water keeps flushing from the Jones Inlet to the Fire Island Inlet. However, in the other parts of Great South Bay, the water quality is, the water's not moving as much and there's a lot more water quality impairment. Um, and, you know, thank goodness for the new inlet that formed during Hurricane Sandy because it does provide some relief uh, to Bellport Bay. But frankly, I remember when that happened, and I remember predicting, oh, this is, you know, this is the best thing ever. This is going to turn Great South Bay around. This is the end of brown tides in Great South Bay because it's going to flush all the water out. That didn't happen. In fact, you know, the inlets for the last decade, um, well, I guess it's only been around about a decade, so <laughs> maybe more like the last eight years or so, is flushing Bellport Bay pretty well. But once you get to the break point between Bellport Bay and Patchog Bay, you lose all those effects. Uh, and so what that does is leave the center part of the bay prone to brown tides, mahogany tides, daisy siphona blooms, low oxygen conditions. Um, and so Robin and I are working on, and we hope by the end of the year to release, a report card for Great South Bay where we sort of put all the data together. And again, it will be quantitative based on state and federal standards and being able to give a grade to the different parts of Great South Bay considering this data and maybe some information on fisheries as well. Um, and also maybe compare to other estuaries, because if you look at Great South Bay, you know, parts of it are as bad as it can get, say some parts of the central part of the bay. Um, but, you know, you go east, Mauritius Bay is not having a great time of things either. So it's important to put things in perspective. Uh, and again, these South Shore Bays are so shallow compared to, you know, Long Island Sound, you can find places 100 feet or more, Peconic Estuary just as deep in some places. But, you know, these shallow bays, what that means is you've got same amount of maybe nutrient loading, but in a very small volume of water. And in addition, the tides on the South Shore are the smallest of all of Long Island. So that's sort of a lethal combo. Um, and so it's important when you're ranking things to compare apples to apples. Uh, and therefore, I think comparing to other South Shore Bays is important. Okay, I'm going to go through this very quickly, but it's an important point to make, and that is climate change, right? So obviously, I'm just talking about water quality, but you know, scientists now call the era we're in, if you haven't heard the word already, the Anthropocene, right? So this is the era where the activities of humans are the dominant influence on climate and the environment, overwhelming natural processes. Right. And so we're in that era. Probably no surprise to anyone. Um, but it's so important to keep this in mind as you as we look to navigate towards managing Great South Bay and Long Island water bodies to be the best versions of themselves they can. You have to be able to account for climate change. And the signs of it are I, I don't I probably everybody knows are so crystal clear now. Uh, last year, 2020 was the warmest year on record. Um, and you can see that this is Noah's global picture. Here are the data sets from four different sources. Uh, in case you don't like NOAA, I've heard some people say, oh, the NOAA data, don't believe that. You know, they're, they're cooking the books. Okay, well, turns out everybody's coming up with the same numbers. Last year was the warmest year ever. And that's actually, I, I, I won't belabor this point, but last year was a La Nina year. 
This year was a La Nina year. Uh, and that simply just means an oceanographic event out in the Pacific Ocean. And you think, oh, well, who cares about the Pacific Ocean? Turns out that is like turning on the air conditioner for planet Earth. And so just to state, put those two, two statements together, we had the air conditioning blasting all across the Pacific Ocean with cold water being brought from the depths to the surface to keep Earth cool. And yet we still set a record. Um, that's trouble. Uh when it gets warmer, the ox the water holds less oxygen, right? So our oxygens are losing our oceans are losing oxygen as we warm up, and that goes for oceans, also our bays. And we're experiencing what's known as ocean acidification, as the levels of CO two go up in the atmosphere, the levels of pH go down. And all across this country, we're not alone. This is a paper I published with colleagues from all across the nation, all corners uh, of this country showing that there's been a statistically significant increase in the coastlines of the U.S. that are experiencing harmful algal blooms. Um, and so, you know, we're not alone, I guess, is, a, is another point to put it. And, and all these things are related to each other with regards to climate change and nutrient loading. And they have interactive effects. And just, just to give you a sense of what that could mean, so we know temperatures are rising and, I, and we know nitrogen levels are increasing. And... As it turns out, that can promote harmful algal blooms. So specifically, I, I don't have the time to go through it today, but yet another harmful algal bloom called rust tides are intensified by more nitrogen and more uh, and higher temperatures. Uh, and then in addition, and so that's harm that that can be a stress on marine life. I'm showing a bay scallop here, uh, and you'll you probably know why, but I'll, you'll see it in the next slide for sure. They don't like it when it gets too hot. They don't like harmful algal blooms. And I already just showed you that when it gets warmer the oxygen levels get lower, uh, and that adds yet another stress. So here you have an organism just trying to get by, experiencing uh, thermal stress, low oxygen, and harmful algal bloom toxins uh, all, all at once. And so, um, well, I guess I took the slide out. So I'll just say, and, and maybe not a surprise, therefore, that the scallop fishery has taken a nosedive on the east end. Um, and in fact, even this year, Scallops look good in on the East End, and they're monitoring them every month. June, July, everything looks good. August, rust tide hit, and they all died off. Um, and but it also ends up being the warmest month and the lowest period of oxygen. And so the and he, so here's the thing: all these things are happening. Fisheries are on the ropes, um, and you know when it comes to global climate change. Everybody's going to do everything they can, and there's obviously progress being made, right? People are talking about hybrid cars, wind power uh, in this country, across the globe. But if we want to take charge of things right here in our own backyard, if we're going to stand where we are, right, and take care of Great South Bay, we need to kind of ignore what's going on globally and just address what we can tackle right here. And frankly, the only lever in front of us right now is mitigating the nitrogen uh, to get the rest of the uh, ecosystem under control um, and, and, and hope that the global climate change issue gets addressed globally. But it really is. It's global, right? Don't forget, there's 1.3 billion people in India and 1.3 billion people in China we need to bring along for the ride as well. So it, thinking about that global issue, we need to tackle this uh, at the local level. And there is a lot of hope towards doing that. And uh, I'll move on to that now. We have people from Suffolk County here. Um, the tagline I use for Suffolk County when it comes to wastewater is from worst to first, because a decade ago, you could argue that the way we were treating our on-site wastewater was the worst you could possibly do, because we were injecting it deep into the ground, which would send it right to our drinking water with no treatment. Now, it is, it's not hyperbole, but fact that Suffolk County has a more robust program for upgrading septic systems than any other county in the nation. It's an incredible feat. Um, and, you know, I think Peter Scully a week ago mentioned this, so I'll steal this line from him. When Suffolk County started doing this uh, six, seven years ago, they did the what they called the magical septical tour. They went to different places to see what they were doing in Rhode Island and what they were doing uh, in Connecticut and Massachusetts. Uh, but now, actually, those states are turning to Suffolk County to figure out what's going on. And in fact, I hosted a group all the way from Hawaii this summer. And uh, they wanted to meet with the people in Suffolk County to figure out, how did you do this? Because we need to do that to protect our coral reefs in Hawaii. Um, so their sub-watersheds plan, 
prioritized all different water bodies across Long Island and to which ones should be the highest priority for upgrading septics. You can see Great South Bay. It's in the highest priority zone, the whole thing. Uh, obviously, some of it's sewer, but anything that's not is in the priority one for upgrading. Uh, and if you look carefully, you can't quite see it. I can't even quite see it. Um, but um, it's calling for about a 50% reduction in nitrogen load. And that can be achieved largely via upgrading septics. Um, and the plan also is it's a 50 year plan. So they're looking out from here to 2070. And by 2050, the plan is to upgrade about two thirds of the septic systems across Suffolk County. So that's forward thinking. And so it's not just, a, not just identifying the problem and the solution, but it's got a plan for enacting that solution. And if you look at the implications, it's enormous. So these are plots of, uh, or what the potential outcomes are, it's enormous. This is uh, Chris Clapp is here, and he calls it the choose your own adventure slide. Uh, and that is you could have the slide and the, the map in the upper left if you do nothing, or the one in the lower right if you do something. And that's nitrate and groundwater. Frankly, anything that's in, a, in the yellow, orange, or red is a, is a danger zone. Uh, because those are areas that not only are definitely going to be making everything worse, but also is frankly a, a potential human health hazard. I don't have time to get into it, but there's emerging evidence that we want the nitrate in our drinking water as low as possible. For the same reason you don't want to eat meats preserved with nitrates, you don't want nitrate in your drinking water. Um, and so we want what's in the lower right, not in the upper left. Okay, so this is going to be, get, this is going to be achieved uh, by their septic improvement program in Suffolk County. You, they've got multiple commercial units that are available off the shelf uh, to be installed. They have grant programs to cover a lot of the install, a lot of the costs for installing them. Um, and so I, if you're interested, you should check out reclaimourwater.info uh, to find out more about that program. Um, I'll very briefly mention that at the university, I also direct something called the New York State Center for Clean Water Technology, where we're harnessing science to engineer clean water for the protection of public health and the environment in New York and beyond. And we have a goal we call 10 20 30. We're trying to design septic systems to get nitrogen down below 10 milligrams per liter, cost less than $20,000, and last more than 30 years. And the, the reason for the $20,000 is because you can get a grant for that much from Suffolk County to cover the full cost of the install. We've developed something we call nitrogen removing biofilters. Uh, they essentially take a what is now, which is really the standard way to deal with wastewater. If you're not in a sewage treatment plant, that's a drain field. But to underlay those drain fields with two layers uh, that transform the nitrogen from the form it's typically in, which is ammonium, into nitrogen gas that will just leave uh, into the atmosphere. And we do that via using combinations of sand and wood chips. Um, this slide got a little messed up. But essentially, um, if you look at these bars here, these are different types of septic systems that have been tested in Suffolk County, the far right is what you get in a normal system. The other ones are commercial systems. In blue and green are the ones that have been approved by Suffolk County, meeting their 19 milligram per liter um, standard. In red are the ones that we developed our nitrogen removing biofilters. We have three different types and they're performing as good as or better than any of the commercial systems. And right now they're in what is known as the piloting stage in Suffolk County. We're expecting them to be available for um, provisional approval and installation by anyone in uh, 2022. The great thing about these nitrogen biofilters beyond moving nitrogen, told you, you, we're drinking our wastewater essentially. These things also remove all sorts of pharmaceuticals, drugs, and personal care products uh, at a level better than any sewage treatment plant and to our knowledge better than any of the um, uh, existing commercial systems. Uh, so things we don't want in our drinking water, they're getting them out. Okay, uh, and then very quickly as I wrap up, a few other things to note. I'm not going to talk about the Shinnecock Bay Restoration Program. If you go to my website there's a, and you go to the videos, you can watch a one-hour lecture on it. But I'll just simply say that we started this program a decade ago. And in one decade, we have increased the densities of juvenile hard plants by 20-fold. We've increased the densities of adult hard plants by more than 5-fold. And the most important thing the landings of hard clams since we began this program in Great South Bay are up 1000%. And you can see it when I started the program, there was, there were no baymen out there raking clams. Now there's a dozen boats out all the time. The landings in, Great, in Shinnecock Bay now exceed Great South Bay. 
Right? It used to be there was tenfold more here. There's actually slightly more yield coming out of Shinnecock Bay. If you look at all the South Shore Bays, every other estuary during the same time period is either flat or declining, whereas the landings in Shinnecock Bay are up a thousand percent. So I don't have time to go into the details, but it's a science-based program uh, that we took care to implement and, um, and, and it's being replicated now through the Long Island Shellfish Restoration Program, which is um, one of the locations for that is in Bellport Bay. Last thing I'll mention is kelp farming. Um, my lab's done a lot of work with seaweeds during the last several years. Seaweeds are amazing organisms. Um, I'll just mention briefly before I get to what they do. Uh, kelp in particular is farmed all across the Northeast US. It's an indigenous seaweed where in fact I have people diving for it out um, to get reproductive kelp in the next week. Uh, they're going just out into Long Island Sound. Uh, it can be integrated into any bivalve farm, in any oyster farm, um, and it grows during the winter. So when an oyster farm is busy during the summer, they don't need to do anything with it. They can just focus on it during the winter when their oysters aren't growing. <laughs> We've established the first DEC permitted hatchery in New York State in 2019. Uh, and we're producing about 50 seed spools of uh, kelp per year. We're going to have 100 this coming year. Uh, these are the 10 oyster farms we've worked on during the last several years, um, growing oysters there. So, Chuck, you probably know most of these farms, or <laughs> of course. Um, and so this has been a great partnership, working with oyster farmers um, to complement what they're already doing. So I don't, I th I'm missing one slide, so I'm just going to go back here to this one right here. So seaweeds are amazing because... They reverse, they do, they perform the service we need and want in our bays. They're photosynthetic. So what that means is they're taking up carbon dioxide and letting out oxygen. Now, remember, I just told you just a few slides back, what's our problem with climate change? CO2 levels are going up, oxygen levels are going down. See, we do the exact opposite. They also, as they grow, take in a bunch of nitrogen, right? And so what do we have a problem with? Too much nitrogen. And the other thing is it's gonna take, as we deal with the septic systems in the watershed, that's taking time and we're making great strides, but it, it's, it's gonna take time to get it done. So we need in the water solutions. Uh, bivalves like the clams in Chicago Bay are part of that solution, but so are the seaweeds because they can take up that nitrogen. If you harvest it, you're actually physically taking nitrogen out of the bay. Uh, and if you get it far away enough, you can, um, you can compost it, reuse a fertilizer uh, and it won't be returning. So back to where I was, we've gotten spectacular yields over time with this kelp. Here's Mike Dole, who I should give all the credit to. He works in my lab uh, and he's headed up our kelp program. You can see how long those kelp blades can get um, and how much kelp you can get. You can see here, we're getting in some years, this is from 2020, we've had up to 10 pounds in one foot of line. So think about that, a foot of line, 10 pounds of kelp. We're putting out 100, the smallest line we put out is 100 feet. Right. And so you know, right there, that's a thousand pounds. And some of our lines are 200 feet, 2000 pounds. And we never put out fewer than three lines. That's 6000 pounds on one oyster farm. Uh, you know, this year we're, we're thinking about putting out literally dozens of lines. So we could have 10,000 pounds just on one from lo one location. Uh, and with all that weight comes all that nitrogen. And it's also carbon sequestration as well. So it does help address climate change. Oh, so this is <laughs> this is a slide I thought I didn't have. So there it is, the CO2 and the nitrogen gets taken out, the oxygen gets put in, and we think that this particular seaweed is also effective against combating some harmful algal blooms. Uh, on the nitrogen removal front, we've done some estimates. If you had a one acre farm, you could be removing over 200 pounds of nitrogen. Now there's a difference between total weight and nitrogen weight. Um, but that's, up to, that's the same as about 10, around 10 septic systems. Um, and so again, I'm not saying do this instead but I'm, of septic systems, but do it in addition to. Okay, so on the harmful algal bloom front, I just wanna, very last thing I think I'm showing is the effect of this kelp on this particular harmful algal bloom, probably the nastiest of them all, makes saxitoxin, which is a thousand fold more potent than cyanide. Um, as I mentioned before, people, this unfortunately can kill people. This is from last summer, people dying in Alaska from exposure to this. It's widespread across Long Island. We've had more than seven locations, shellfish beds close to shellfishing because of these toxins in the bivalves. And so what you see here on the right, B is the normal cells. A is when you expose them to the kelp. 
And as it turns out, they just start lysing. Um, so here's an experiment. We had a control, we did nothing. We added some nutrients or we added the nutrients with the kelp. You can see we had a decline in more than threefold in just a few days from exposure to kelp. And then the probably the most impactful experiment we did was growing seafood, specifically mussels with and without kelp and showing that the kelp can actually reduce the amount of toxins that get into the bivalves and at a critical level above 80 micrograms per 100 grams of shellfish tissue, you have to close down a shell fishery. We can get it below that by exposing those muscles, co-growing the muscles with the kelp. Um, and just very briefly, they can also combat ocean acidification. I mentioned that, but look at the pH just jump when you grow kelp in seawater compared to, and this seawater has been acidified. And it's just a matter of days, you can correct that problem with the kelp. And that's why, um, it's just last night I wrote an abstract for a meeting the name of the action was called the halo effect because we think these seaweeds can be important. We're not going to fix our problems. I don't want to make this a panacea. We're not going to fix all of our nitro problems with kelp. We're not going to fight glo global climate change with kelp. But we can set up a halo effect for oyster farmers and other seaweed and other shellfish approaches to create a better environment uh, within the near field location uh, of the kelp. And, and also, I should also mention other seaweeds. I focused on kelp here, which is great, but our water quality impairments happen during summer. So we're actually now pivoting to a red seaweed called Grassolaria. We just got funding from New York Sea Grant to promote Grassolaria as a summer seaweed to grow on oyster farms. Okay, so I'm done. Hopefully that wasn't too long, but I will just make the concluding statements. We know excessive nitrogen loading from wastewater is a threat to coastal ecosystems, economies, pets, human health. Climate change is accelerating, uh, and we can now see that and the effects it's having. Upgrading septic systems are a primary tool for mitigating and reversing water quality impairment and removing other organic contaminants from our drinking water. And seaweeds, as well as shellfish, hold the promise to uh, mitigate water quality impairment. So with that, I'm done, and I thank you so kindly for your attention.